data has gotten too big. Whether you're a B2B marketer or a consumer brand, your data needs to be viable, relevant, and accessible so that Starista can help you retain customers, acquire customers, and make it personal. Welcome to the Marketing Stir Podcast by Starista, probably the most entertaining marketing podcast you're going to put in your ear. I'm Vin, the associate producer here at Starista. The goal of this podcast is to chat with industry leaders and get their take on the current challenges of the market, and we'll have a little fun along the way. In today's episode, Vincent and AJ chat with Mary Rogers, Head of Marketing Communications at Cuisinart. She talks about how being inclusive when targeting audiences helps boost marketing efforts. AJ returns from his vacation, and Vincent is glad to not be in Texas summer heat. Give it a listen. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to another episode of Starista's The Marketing Stir. I am your happy host, Vincent Petrofessa the Vice President of B2B Products and Partnerships here at Starista. It is so great to be talking to you. I felt like it's been a while. It's, you know, I just feel that way. But love that people are listening to this podcast. We keep growing. I love that we are now, I'm going to conferences. Conferences are back and people are coming up to me. Let's, let's be clear. It's not like 75 people coming up to me and being like, oh my God, I listen to your podcast. I'm not Harry Styles for those young listeners out there. But people are like, I love your podcast. I listen to it while I'm on the treadmill or working and we appreciate that. Come up to me more. We'd really do love hearing that. First of all, if you're new listeners, welcome. Who's Starista? We're like, who and who's this guy? And why is he like this all the time? But who who is Starista? Let's pause for a second, just talk about Starista for like 10 seconds and then we don't mention it the rest of the podcast. Marketing technology company. We own our own business to business data, our own business to consumer data. People utilize that data, our partners to help target that data, to get new customers. We have our own sending platform for email. We own our own DSP called Adster. We do connected TV, display, OTT. Email me at vincent at starista.com if you need anything. That's all. I'm confident that we can help you. I just gave you my email address, ladies and gentlemen. The other thing I'm confident in, and I got to see him, and I will see him soon because we are attending the B2B Sales and Marketing Exchange Conference in Boston, August 10th through the 12th. Go to that. Come see us. Ladies and gentlemen, my co-host, Mr. AJ Gupta. What's going on, AJ? Hey, Vincent. Just back from a refreshing week at Yellowstone. So I'm uh, in need of a break from my vacation now. I have vacation from the vacation. I saw those pictures. I'm like, you look like the you were in the movie City Slickers. Remember that movie? You were just like <laughs> ha- having fun. I saw you with just different animals. There was a bear, then there was a moose. I'm like, where is this guy? But I love seeing the pictures. Beautiful sunsets. I was it looked like a postcard when you were posting them. Yeah, unfortunately, it was about well, it was 50 to 70 degrees there, and I got back to Texas, and it's about 110. And yeah. so, yeah, my, my body's having a little bit of a tough time adjusting. I would imagine 111. That's just why. Why do people do that to themselves? Why do people do that? It's not right. It's not fair. It's but I'm glad I'm not in Texas in the summer. Uh, you're going to you and I are going to see each other. We've got the San Francisco trip coming up. We've got right. a, a Boston. You're coming up back to my way, Boston, Massachusetts. So that will be fun. So we're happy to have you. And AJ, let me tell you something about some of the guests that we've had on. Love them all. Some of the brands I've discovered for the first time. Other brands I know, I love, and I've used my whole life. They make me smile. They make me smile because when I hear this brand, and wait till you hear our guest because I, you know, go back. I feel like I've, I've known her a long time and I just met her. That's the warmth I get from this guest. And that's the warmth I get when I think of this brand. Cuisinart, Cuisinart, Cuisinart. You know it, you know this brand. If you don't, you live under a rock. But what reminds me, family gatherings, cookware, you know, what I'm cooking. It, it's the first cooks that I ever had. I asked for it when I was graduating college. And I was out in that real world, so I asked for it. And I still own it today, and I have new products as I grow and my family grows. 
but we are really proud to have this brand and this guest. Ladies and gentlemen, the head of marketing communications, Mary Rogers. What's going on, Mary? Nice to be here today. I'm very excited to um, be speaking with you, and um, I really look forward to it. We're happy to have you, Mary. You know, you and I talking, we kind of live in that same tri-state area. We, I, I love the brand. You love the brand. Boy, we're going to get into that. And I couldn't stop smiling when you and I were talking kind of uh, in the beginning, because I'm like, you know, again, there's some, like I said, brands that I discover and, and we, we learn. I'm like, oh, is that, that's what you do? And then you have those brands that you, you grow up with and, and you know. And it just brings that warm feeling. I go right to my mother cooking, my grandmother, me cooking in the kitchen, gathered around, serving. It's, I don't know, I can go on and on about all the products and what the brand means to me. But for those, again, living under a rock out there and they don't know Cuisine Art, tell us about it. Tell us about your role specifically and some of your duties there. So um, Cuisinart, the brand, was born in 1971, and um, it was founded by a Carl Sondheimer, who was an MIT engineer, and um, he had, um, his passion was around cooking and also French cuisine, and so he had taken a trip with his um, wife, Shirley, at the, his wife, Shirley, and to France, and he had discovered um, a method of, um, of speeding up food, food preparation in the kitchen. He then designed the original food processor, which launched in 1973, which actually changed the way that consumers prepared food in their home kitchen. It gave them the ability to speed up um, complicated um, processes and, and get them done very quickly. And also it, it came in really handy because in the seventies, uh, um, that time period was really when people were kind of getting out of that industrialized food kind of um, segment where they were going from a lot of like, like prepared, you know, boxed items to really actually coming to the forefront of, of where cuisine and food preparation is today. It's, it was becoming, um, you know, obviously Julia Child, James Beard, there were several well-known uh, celebrity chefs, like those early celebrity chefs who actually helped bring the brand along because um, they used the product. But uh, one of the things people don't know about Cuisinart is in 71, um, 1971, they um, first started distributing very high-end cookware that was made um, in Europe. And so that's where they kind of got their, their foray into like the gourmet stores and those kind of small boutique shops that are really hands-on service to customers. Because, uh, you know, you can imagine a food processor is a, you know, high, high education product. Um, to bring something like that onto the marketplace, you're like, when you're changing people's behavior, it's, uh, you know, it takes a lot of effort. And so um, the food processor is basically um, iconic to the brand and where, mm -hmm. where the brand started. And still today, one of our most popular, um, our, our most popular food processor is the classic styled uh, food processor um, that kind of has been in the line for a very, very long time. And um, not the original one, but the kind of second generation one is, is, is the, I mean, it's been modified and updated and changed over time, but the shape is very classic, mm -hmm. integrates well into almost any style kitchen. Um, and so um, your, net, your second question to me was about my career, you know, about my work at Cuisinart. So I head up marketing communications at Cuisinart. I work across the entire brand portfolio. Um, we work under a master brand portfolio. So, um, which makes it nice and clean and easy for me. <laughs> and, um, you know, my area of, um, of the business is um, brand marketing. Um, I also uh, oversee all the D2C, e-commerce, consumer acquisition, market research. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting something, but basically <laughs> everything but product development. I mean, yeah. I am involved in the product development process by, you know, guiding product development with, you know, supporting primary research and concept testing and things like that. So it's not as if I'm not 
in any way involved in that. It's just that I'm not the one who is overseeing that complex process um, with our products, especially in the electrics, um, you know, the durable goods business, you know, it's a pretty complicated process to, to um, design, develop, launch and manufacture a product. Hmm. And with, with Cuisinart, you're right. Like my first foray into it, it was the food processor, right? It, that's the food processor. I still have one. And I also have cookware, I have some cutlery, but it's obviously so much more than that now. Uh, grilling, yeah. bakeware, flatware. Yes, we have a we have a very we have a very extensive line of products. Um, you know, we have basically kind of group them in two ways. We have our uh, you know electrics products, and then the other product categories we call non electrics because it's everything else that doesn't get plugged in. So everything from you know, like I said cookware, gadgets, cutlery, um, you know, the gamut of, of uh, the kitchen categories, basically. We pretty well represented across, um, you know, cookware and non-electric, uh, uh, electrics and non-electrics. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So Mary, the other question that we ask all of our guests is how you got into the space? How'd you get into marketing? How'd you get into marketing communications? These stories are never the same from guest to guest. So we'd love to hear your story. So um, interestingly enough, when I was in high school, I, well, first of all, I, I was talking to somebody today and I said, you know, my first real job, I worked at an, at an ice cream <laughs> place. Um, and that's how I learned to count money. And I also learned how to, that was like my first foray, everything from doing dishes to making ice cream cones and milkshakes. But after that, um, I also started working in a nursing home because I had um, planned on going to nursing school. Well, I shouldn't say planned because I actually did go to nursing school. <laughs> I started in nursing school, but obviously I'm not there now. Um, and so my aunt is a nurse and she was kind of um, encouraging me and I really was interested in it. And also having the experience of working in a um, acute care facility was something that, you know, was kind of life-changing when you're like in high school. Um, it exposes you to a lot of things that you, some people would never get exposed to. But I went to college for nursing. I, um, I was not a great memorizer. And when you were in nursing, you have to memorize every bone in the body and every vein and um, that was not my foray. Um, and then I actually switched into English literature because really my, um, at that time in my life, I was writing poetry and I was doing a lot of writing for self-expression. And, you know, that was one of my, that's really one of my real, that's my real kind of talent. Um, and and uh, that's kind of my foray, how I ended up going into communications at the end of the day. But after college, I worked in retail, and this is kind of kind of all kind of circles around in, in a way. Um, it's not a you know it's never a, a direct journey. <laughs> um, and so I worked in retail. I worked in housewares, and I I was just um, married at the time, and I was in you know I started in the assistant buying area, in like believe it or not, like lingerie, then men's and boys, and then I ended up in housewares. And then they um, promoted me and they wanted me to go into store. Basically the process there was you would go into stores, then you would have to go out into the field and not necessarily be in the home office. And um, I worked in store operations, which was not conducive to someone who just gotten married because the schedule in store operations is like, on Monday, you open on Tuesday, you close on Tuesday, you close on Wednesday, you open and you it was like a seesaw um, schedule. And it was just not not conducive at that point. And I ended up um, then going into um, publishing. So uh, marketing and publishing, and that was my first um, real job in marketing. And I progressed from there. And then obviously, um, I transitioned back to the home goods area which is, I worked for um, Dansk, which is now owned by Food52. I worked for Farberware, this was all in marketing. And then um, obviously went from there 
to Cuisinart. Cuisinart was always on my radar as an up and coming brand. Um, it was very intriguing to me. And um, I happened to uh, get lucky and they were looking for somebody in marketing communications because they were trying to take the brand from, it's kind of small, really quite small compared to where it is now. And they were really looking to um, take the brand to the next step. And so that's how I ended up joining the company at that, at that point. But it was also at a point in, you know, where the marketing channels were a lot smaller than they are today. <laughs> so it's, you know, it was definitely at that time when I joined the company, much more like the kind of traditional marketing channels. So as you can imagine, um, there's been a lot, a lot of progress in that area um, over the years. So that's how I ended up here. Mary, what a, a fascinating background. As Vincent said, every story is very unique. And, uh, and yours in particular with the writing portion, I have a master's in creative writing. And uh, my parents were worried for a long time that it would not translate into a job. So, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I think the writing actually translates well into a a lot of things, probably not like a neurosurgeon or something along those lines, but <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and sometimes you don't realize like some, some inherent talent of your own, that it's something like other people just struggle with horribly. Right. And, and it's really interesting because like, you know, I, I write all the time for um, lots of different things, obviously. Right. Um, but like, for me, I can just sit down and I just, knock it out and it's and I have other people on my team is like I'm really struggling to get get some thoughts around this and um and it was funny too when I went back to get my I went back to school to get my MBA you know not that long ago and um you know when you're studying for your your MBA you have to do a lot of writing and so for me that was like I was like, this is just right up my alley. <laughs> um, you know, economics, on the other hand, was, you know, I had to put some effort into that. <laughs> uh, so, Mary, it's so rare to see somebody working for a company as long as you have, uh, you know, at a time your average work span is less than two years at a company. So tell us a little bit about your experience working here and, you know, what are some of the most valuable things you have learned? So a lot of people ask me this quite often because you're right. It's, it's basically an unheard of in, in many ways. So people say to me, why, why have you been there for so long? And the, the real reason at the end of the day is that I have a lot of freedom in the way that I run my share of the business. Um, we are not like highly um, bureaucratic. So it's not like I talk to colleagues at other companies and they're like, I have to talk to this person and I have to run it up the flagpole three times. And, and we are very, currently we're a very decentralized organization. So though um, their company is trying to become more centralized in certain aspects uh, of the business. Um, and so that is really what's kept me there. I, I have a lot of freedom to make decisions I have, a, a, you know, I have freedom to write my own roadmap for the business. Um, you know, I, I think that at the end of the day is what has kept me there. And also marketing in itself has changed so drastically over the last five and 10 years that, you know, that in and of itself has kept it so interesting and intriguing for me because I said, I've worked with a company for a really long time. And I have not had one day that's been exactly the same as another. And for me, that's something that I find very um, powerful, you know, because it's interesting. It's every day is different. And, um, you know, and, but I have a direct impact on, on my decisions and, and my roadmap items that I can execute on. Mary, tell us a little bit more about what are some of the channels and that are working for you? What, what are things that may not be working, but would love to get some insight on your marketing strategy? Yeah. So one of the things that I pride myself on is we don't chase things. You know, we, we enter when we think it's appropriate for the brand and the business. We, you know, I think this is a, a an issue I've seen across marketing it doesn't matter what brand it is, where, you know, 
they want to be first there, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's right for their customer, the consumer. Um, and so, you know, we're really very strategic about entering new channels. You know, we examine it. We also try to time it so it's appropriate. We also have to make sure that our, our consumer that we're trying to reach is also going to be engaged in that channel. Doesn't make a lot of sense for us to be in channels where our type of customer that we're trying to reach is not present. Um, and I'll give you an example of this. So one of the things that's been on our roadmap for a little bit has been social commerce. And we tested it about three or four years ago and consumers were not yet there. But it was, you know, we had a lot of great learnings. We had built the infrastructure for it. But now we're ready to really act on it. And so that's a channel that we're going into that's new for us. So this is like, when I say social commerce, this is shopping directly on the social platform. And uh, consumers are, are much more accepting of that now than they had been three or four years ago. So that's a channel that we're developing. Um, and we have obviously uh, our partner in that is Salsify. We work with them on, on uh, our, you know, PIM and a few other things, um, digital shelf audits and, um, you know, this segment that we're just adding is called orders and inventory, but um, that's one of the items that we are focused on for this year. A few others, affiliates is something that we're um, planning on executing on for new channels, but this all ties back to our um, execution of bringing um, D to C and e-commerce in-house in late 2018. Thank you. Well, well set up before the pandemic, so we weren't we weren't chasing that. Um, and uh, we have always been selling direct to consumer, but not not um, not fully enclosed within the organization. We were using a fulfillment company and flat filing orders to them, and you know, but still storefronting the experience to our consumers ourselves, so we could also make sure that we were collecting the first party data too. So. That's something that um, has been um, a focus for our corporation as a growth pillar also. So, um, you know, we are very thoughtful in the way that we approach new channels. Um, because the other thing I find too is like, if you put so much energy into something that you really don't, haven't well examined, haven't decided if it works with your strategy, you're also sucking up resources that may not produce anything on behalf of the brand or the business. So you have to also look at what, you know, this is the way I, this is the way I handle this, but it's not necessarily the way, I'm not saying my way is the only way, I'm just saying that I think that marketers sometimes need to be more thoughtful in the way they approach things, because a lot of times they want to put kind of the badge on the portfolio and, you know, I did that or like, I'll give you the latest example, the metaverse, which is, you know, the kind of the latest, you know, shining bobble or bobble um, that people are chasing. And, you know, I'm definitely studying it. You know, how can, how does this work with our business? Is this the area we need to be in? Is this something that makes sense for us? Um, and, um, you know, where should we go from here, basically? Uh, Mary, I, uh, I also wanted to add one thing that I know you won't say because you're very humble, but a testament to longevity there is that you also do a great job. You know, you just don't get to keep a job for, you know, 20 years, right? Plus uh, where you have to also be good. So that's a testament to you. I just wanted to add that for you. And also, Mary, tell us about, you were talking about social media. Social media has changed a tremendous amount, even in the last like 10 years, but how has Cuisinart like, embraced it? Are there any channels that really work for you? Any channels that surprise you? Is, is Cuisinart on, on TikTok? Like that would be a surprising channel for me, right? But I, I would imagine that, that maybe it'll work. Talk to me about it. So we, yeah, interesting. So we still see um, Instagram and Facebook as, you know, I'm going to give you a couple, but Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, and also YouTube are, are channels that work really well for us um, for many different reasons. Um, you know, YouTube, we've discovered that people want to come there when they want to understand, you know, if maybe they're not using their product correctly, or maybe, you know, oh, how do I do this? So we've been doing a lot more, what we're referring to as like 
troubleshooting videos. So we work with our customer service teams and we are really close to them about what do you think people are going to want to know about this product or where they may like not necessarily operate it properly or put it together right way or and we do that in advance of the product coming out. And then after the product comes out, we touch base with them again. What types of things are people calling about? And then we build content around that. So um, that's a channel that we're using that way. Obviously for Instagram and Facebook, you know, it's about inspiration, engagement. Um, you know, we use a combination of self develop content, influencer content, content creator content. And so that's how we are using that channel. We are on TikTok, but only very recently. And, you know, that was, that's another area where we're using um, a lot of content creators to create and produce stuff for us based on our, you know, our marketing calendar and a few other things, because, um, you know, there's a lot of food oriented material on TikTok, you know, how I made that, how I did that. Um, and so I think there's, you know, there's room for us to grow there. And um, I also know that TikTok announced they were going to do social commerce. And now it seems like they peeled back a little bit. So, you know, we'll keep our eye on that um, going forward. So, um, you know, those are, I would say the top channels that our consumers are engaged in. You know, we're, you know, we're not, I mean, I'll give you an example of something that we're not, we're not currently using. We're not, um, we're not active on Twitter. Hmm. And it's just interesting too, because, you know, the way that we, we actually did have um, you know, activity on Twitter and we basically didn't have a lot of engagement. We just didn't see our customers there. It became a platform that was very media oriented and celebrity politics and for us to insert ourselves in that, it's it started to make little to no sense. So we had abandoned that channel. Um, we had at one point we had um, we did have like an editorial type um, channel where we were like posting you know um, news and things like that. But we ended up also finding that that was really we didn't have we found we were not not getting a lot of engagement. So. You know, we have to, you have to continually examine each of these channels to see if they still make sense for you. And, but you should also like, as the channel grows, keep up with the, you know, where they're going, what their roadmap is, and then how you can integrate that into the work that you're doing for, you know, on behalf of the brand. But, you know, it's at the end of the day, it's about serving our consumer, you know, and if we're able to serve, inspire, delight our consumer, you know, that's why we're in those channels. Um, obviously, at the end of the day, we want to, you know, inspire them to, you know, be in the brand family and, you know, um, you know be able to also keep them engaged long term, not just for the moment. So yeah. that's kind of how, um, how we look at it. I yeah, know that's very interesting. And, and thanks for sharing that, because, you know, a lot of people just say, oh, all, all social channels work. And it's good to know that you, you, Obviously, you have to try them, and then if certain ones don't work, you have to pivot. So, no, I thank you for sharing that. I want to stay on your consumers. Can you? T did you notice over the past few years that your consumers' behavior or demographic has changed in any way? If so, how? So, I would say one of the one of the things that we have noticed um, over time is that, you know, originally the housewares home goods business had been very oriented around um, women. And, um, you know, as things changed in my eyes, antidotally and also research wise, primary research wise, we are reflecting more of an adult US based audience. Um, and so we've seen quite an evening out of the genders over time significantly. <laughs> yep. Well, and also if you start really like thinking about consumer behavior, like behavior, behavior, in-home behavior, mm -hmm. you know, men are much more engaged in cooking and also shared res responsibilities in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, you know, I know, I also know a lot of working women who, um, this is antidotal, um, who also have like, have like the kids and the, and the you know, the big career and this and that. And so in some ways they've also kind of allowed that maybe responsibility to go to um, their partner and not necessarily be sole their sole responsibility as it had been in the past. 
So we've seen a really, really interesting evening out and more, and more engagement um, by, by men, which is great. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, we, we are a very inclusive brand. We are not just marketing to women. You know, that's not something that we do. Um, you know, and it's, I think it's reflective also in, in the primary research results. Um, also, you know, we're very appealing to young people. A lot of times, sometimes inside the organization, they'll say things like, you know, we're not appealing to young people, but then it's like, you show them the data and it's like, yes, we are. We're really strong in that area. Um, but sometimes you tell them that and they just have it set in their mind that, you know, it's not, you know. So one of the interesting things that um, that we started to do is we do we started doing a, a brand tracker about a year ago. That was something that was like really on my to do list. I really wanted to get that, you know, um, launched and then have it done consistently. For our business, it doesn't make sense to do something like that on a quarterly basis. It's something because our business doesn't change that dramatically quarter to quarter. So um, we, we are doing it on a, on a yearly basis. We're just about to approach our second year on that. But the interesting thing is we started to compare the data that we collect from our brand tracker to other primary research to see like if we, um, one of the people I work with, they call it the sniff test, you know, what do you see on the data that you collected on a nationally distributed basis and what are the the data points that we are also checking in and and they're really close they're very very close so that gives us a lot of confidence in um the numbers and like i said gender has changed i would say you know in kitchen behavior is probably one of the other biggest changes and you know during the pandemic you know everybody was home you know rediscovering their passion for cooking in the kitchen and also you know, out of sheer necessity, but I also think that, you know, it depends on um, how engaged you are in that process to begin with. For myself, I, I love to cook. It's a passion of mine. Um, I also find it like creative. It's very creative. It's a, for me, it's a creative outlet. It's not a creative, creative outlet for everyone. There's moms out there with kids that have full-time jobs and they need to come home and they need to make a meal for their family and feel good about it. And, you know, that for them may, may be their like weekday behavior, but they might put a little more extra love and effort into it on the weekend when they have more time and they um, are their family's home and they want to make it special for them. So um, I think that that's another thing that's, that's changed um, dramatically. I also think during the pandemic, people get, did experience cooking fatigue. I will tell you that even for myself, who, you know, I was work from home for like, from like March to July, um, full time. And so, so was my husband who um, was a teacher. And, you know, after having to sling three meals a day for like months on months on months on months on months. And I have to tell you, even, even a, you know, a passionate, uh, home cook can get where, you know, can get worn down. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we're doing now too, is like, you know, we're always keeping our eye on what's important to the consumer. Like how can we help them, you know, navigate, um, the current economic environment and how can we, you know, teach them that, you know, instead of, you know, when they go to the store, instead of like spending X, Y, Z on a certain food product that's pre pre-made, how do we help you think about that in a different way? And how can we help you economize, you know, or just, I'll give you an instance of, or for instance, like hummus, you know, you want to buy hummus in the store. It's five dollars you can buy a, a can of garbanzo beans for less than a dollar um if you're you know if you're a good shopper you can you know get some deals on it too and so you can make a snack for your family that is extremely healthy um super nutritious and so simple and easy to make if you know when you have a food processor and you don't have to have like the gigantic, you know, 14 cup model, you can have a smaller formatted model. We even have items where um, you can, you know, we have attachments that go on more of a blender base, or you can even, 
make it in a blender. It takes a little more finesse to do it in a blender because you need a little more, you need to be a little more um, liquefied. You need a more, little more um, liquid to add in there. But things like that, like helping them think along those lines, um, you know, how can I get great snacks on the table for kids during summer? So we're always thinking about those things on how we can serve our consumer in a different way. Mary, here's a fun question we ask all our guests. Uh, I'm sure you get a lot of emails and LinkedIn messages trying to solicit and sell you something. What's one that really gets your attention? And more importantly, what's one that really annoys you? So I, I love when people reach out to me with a new interesting product that's relative to my business or that they've actually maybe done a little bit of research on the brand, or maybe even like looked up some of the work that I've done for the company and understand where I might have some pain points. You know, where am I, what am I trying to solve for? I, I think those things are um, super helpful to me. I would say, you know, I, one of the things I do out of habit is I, in the morning I get up and like typical marketers, you know, you catch up on like the latest news. And obviously this week, there's a lot going on in the retail industry with a lot of um, significant sales. Um, and they've been matched by like a lot of retailers. So it's not just become a, a week for one retailer, it's become a week for many retailers. So um, I do all my reading. I, I read a lot of, I follow a lot of big companies on LinkedIn and I follow a lot of, you know, uh, well-known marketers. Um, but I would say the ones that I dislike the most <laughs> are the ones that reach out to you and um, you'll say something like, um, it's not something I'm interested in right now, but it, and then they just keep bombarding you with yeah. messages. It's like, I, it's like, please, you know, stop. <laughs> um, and, and the thing is too, is like, one of the things I was talking to our head of IT, our CIO about this, and it's like, you know, I set up, um, an automatic signature for email signature. And it's like, you know, solicit you know non uh, non solicitation it's like thank you for sending you know your email i'm not interested in your product but please remove me from the mailing list <laughs> that's that good was, that's the first <laughs> yeah and now i was like oh that's a great idea i love that because obviously but half the time they don't listen anyway or the best ones are you know the ones that they email you and they say oh, do you know is there something you don't like you know and they give you the a b c i'm like you know Leave me alone. Uh, how about E? It's you I don't like. I don't like you for reaching no, out to me. It has nothing to do with whether or not I like somebody. I, I think know. it's I think the thing is that, and I will tell you something. I have I have worked with a lot of companies that have reached out to me. Okay. I have done that, but it has to be meaningful to my business and it has to solve a problem for me. So I mean it's you have to be open-minded to it, but I also think that the, the, the people that you reach back to when you say, this is not really something I'm looking at now, I might look at it in six months. You know, I think that that's something that um, needs to be respected. And uh, Mary, what's kind of something cool or something new that's coming out? So we just launched this really unique um, coffee maker. It's called our Grind and Brew Single Serve. And, you know, we actually, that's where what grinding, brew, grind, whoops, grind and brew single serve um, is a category that we were in quite a long time ago and kind of was our foray into, into the coffee category, what we have become known for. And, you know, as you can imagine, you know, grinding whole beans fresh um, gives you the most flavorful, uh, low acid results um, for coffee. And um, so we, we designed this product, this grind and brew single serve that's really cool. It actually is a nice small format. So it's great for any size kitchen. It's not, you know, it's, it's nice and sleek. It actually grinds the beans and dispenses them automatically into a reusable filter basket and filter cup. And then you take that and you put it into the single serve side of the machine and you are brewing a cup of coffee from whole beans without having to deal with any, you know, um, disposable cups. 
uh, or pods as we refer to them as. And so, you know, it's also extremely economical. Um, you know, it's great for the environment because you're not putting anything in, back into the, you know, the system. Um, and it also makes an amazing cup of coffee. So that's something that we just launched. Um, we're doing a lot of marketing around that. Um, also um, focused on, you know, upcoming September where we're going to be launching um, a lot of uh, marketing campaigning because September is also National Coffee Month. So it's a super important month for us and for our business. And so um, you'll see a lot of activity around that. The product is already distributed nationally. So it's available at stores. It's um, $149. 95 is the price point. So it's a, a nice price point. It's like I said, well-designed, beautifully made, very nice product. That's awesome. That's, um, you know, all our listeners who are business executives, you know, I'm sure drink coffee myself included. That's a nice, uh, cool product on the go. I don't know that about the low acid. Uh, that's yeah. pretty cool. Uh, my, yeah, so uh, yeah. All my, my uh, acid reflux sufferers out there, including myself uh, in that category. That's awesome. Yeah. So basically um, what happens is it's a, it's a burr grinder mechanism. So it crushes the beans. It doesn't chop them, which is a, it's a better process. It's also super consistent. You get a super consistent grind. But the other thing is if, um, if the coffee maker is designed um, and it, it doesn't over extract the beans, you get, you get a, a very consistent flavor. And also, um, you know, when you over extract, that's when you get more acid. So um, that's super hmm. important. So um, it makes a nice smooth cup of coffee. And also the great thing about it too, is that you can use any type of bean that you prefer. My husband likes to buy from small local makers who, who roast their own beans. So if that's something that is um, um, important to you. Other, the other thing I've found over time too, is that Consumers like to blend their, you know, they're always doing something you never imagined they'd do, right? They like to blend their own beans. So they'll co-mingle, you know, two different varieties of beans and make their own custom blend and personalize it. So I think that's super interesting too. I love that. I love that. So it'll be in September and September is also back to school. A lot of people, I mean, college or need that cookware uh, off campus. They need different uh, supplies. That's, uh, that's pretty cool. I got to look out for that. But, but uh, it'll be hard for me to get away from my current Cuisinart coffee maker with the timer that I've had for 16 years, ladies and gentlemen. It's still running. It's still running perfectly. This is a true story. So uh, this is a true story. No exaggeration. So, Mary, just a, a couple more here before we wrap. You know, what is a campaign that you were involved in or Cuisinart has been involved in? that you were really proud of over the years where you, know, you were like, wow, that really made a difference. That was, we sold a lot of products or just people really talk about this product a lot. Love to hear that. So I would say one of the, one of my proudest accomplishments, <laughs> I'm not very good at talking about my, my accomplishments <laughs> publicly. Um, That's why I added those in for I, know, I, need, yeah. to do, I need to do a better <laughs> job at that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, well, you, your your experience and your resume speaks for itself. That's why I don't need to do it. You need, to, you know, that's why guys like me do it. You know. So um, I would say my my proudest accomplishment when it comes to a product success would be we um, launched an air fryer um, in late 2017. It was and it was one of these products. You know, when you work for a company that's very entrepreneurial, you know they. They don't necessarily do concept research on every product. Well, you can't, for our business, you couldn't do it for every product. But um, what happened was they, the original founder of the company came up with this idea of making a um, oven formatted um, air fryer. Up until that point, they had been what we refer to as basket style, which are still on the market. They're the ones that you, you know, it's kind of a drawer, you know, you open the drawer and the food is in there. And, it's more kind of like piled on top of each other. Um, you don't get as good of results with some of the style uh, basket fryers, but there's improvements are being made with those. So anyway, they came out with this concept and they were, and it was one of those things where it didn't exist. You know, there's always the struggle when something doesn't exist before, because there's not a, you know, where do we put it? Do we put it with the basket fryer, you know, retailers, do we put it with the ovens? If it's with the ovens, you know, how are people going to distinguish that from a different oven? 
So what ended up happening was um, after the product was actually fully developed and <laughs> in, in inventory, they came to me and they said, we don't understand what's going on with this product. You know, we need your help, this and that. I said, okay, well, I think what we need to do, because look, I'm, I'm more than happy to say, look, this is a category we don't know. You know, this is not coffee makers, it's not food processors. It's a category that we do not know. So we ended up doing very extensive primary research. We actually um, did everything from understanding the wants and needs of consumers to testing advertising and understanding advertising messaging, what was the most me important messaging to consumers, you know, and then how to, you know, obviously the positioning of the product. So what ended up happening was not only did we come out of that study with, you know, how to actually market the product to the consumer, but also our future product roadmap. We got, we had so many great ideas from the consumers that enabled us to take one product and make an entire line of products out of it. And so, as you can imagine, it's also was, and still is the largest growing category in our business. It's about a billion dollars, I think right now. It's, it's huge and it still has legs, you know, and we're still doing line extensions to that. You know, we have some items that are coming out later in the fall, um, which are going to be um, really interesting. There's basically, like I said, two formats, the oven format and the basket format. And um, the uh, basket format, I think, is the one that's like a billion dollars, but it's it's wow. pretty significant. And I would say that by far um, was, you know, there were other ones. It wasn't the, I know, I'm not, it wasn't a one hit wonder. No, no, <laughs> no. We know that. We know that. <laughs> You know, one of the early ones was basically the grind and brew format for coffee makers. That was another one that I'm super proud about too. That's, you know, still a concept that's still on the line and that's we're still awesome. marketing it in different formats too. So, um, but, you know. That is cool. Yeah, the, the air fryer it changed the game. That's one of those products that, uh, you know, in a while that's come out, you're like, wow, this is, this is changing the game. That's great. Mary, I can't let you leave without talking about, you said Julia Child's one of the first things you said in the, uh, in this interview here. And I got it. So how did Julia Child's influence the brand? Everyone knows Julia Child's. Everyone should know James Beard, but not as, you know, well known as Julia Child's. James Beard, the James Beard Award. Yeah, if a chef gets that, you know, he or she is really good. But the Julia Child's, how did she influence the brand? Well, not only Julia Child, but Jacques Pepin also, because they actually started using the products in, you know, we have a lot of our products are used in cooking shows. And also you'll see demos on, you know, on morning shows that you'll see our products used. So that's really where um, they got, they actually got traction. Um, Carl Sondheimer was very smart. He build a lot of relationships with well-known celebrity chefs who um, use the product and, you know, consumers would see it that way and it would be demoed and used. And that's how he started really building up the brand. I actually personally worked with Julia Child, um, not at, not at Cuisinart, but at, um, at Farberware when I was there. Mm -hmm. um, she was actually one of my idols, even before I got to work with her personally. Wow. And she was such a cool down to earth, really um, really kind person. And, um, you know, and you have to really look at what she did, um, for educating consumers with, you know, in a fun, you know, and, um, and still, but still educational way, you know, she really got people, um, interested in, you know, fine cooking really. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, the thing is too, it's super important to talk about, um, this, we do a lot of work with, um, some supporting some, some schools and hospitals with education with, um, young people, because, you know, a lot of that has been removed from the education system. And so now, um, people are really heavily reliant on parents teaching, um, you know, cooking skills to their children and, um, also organizations. Like I said, we work with, uh, comp a group called Charlie Cart, which supplies cookware and items um, to teach nutrition inside hospitals for children. So that's that's really cool. We're also always looking for opportunities to, um, you know, do thoughtful things that make sense for the brand um, in those areas too. So 
That uh, I, I I love it. I can't not think of Julia Childs and hear that amazing voice, uh, that powerful voice of hers, that iconic voice, that uh, in in my head. Uh, lastly, Mary, we, we got to know you at personal level. You know, uh, poetry, your love of cooking, but. I have to ask this last question. What is a kitchen item you cannot live without? Mine is my Cuisinart uh, coffee maker. There's a timer, wakes up in the morning, pop, it's ready to go. What is yours? So, I mean, it's hard for me to pick one, but yeah. I would it's say- like picking a favorite child, right? <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. a, and <laughs> I would say, and maybe this is just because it's been so successful for, for us and um, I worked so hard on it, but um, I would say our- Cuisinart air fryer toaster oven, and we have a new model with a grill. It has grill, grilling function, so you can grill in, indoors. Um, I use it literally almost every day. If we're not grilling outside, uh, my husband and I are big, we're outside all the time if we can be. You know, the weather's been beautiful on the East Coast recently, so we're outside like every night until like 10 o'clock, which, you know, sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but. Um, but I use it every day. It's perfect for like, I can put like two pieces of salmon in there and I can have it done in like less than 15 minutes. I can do, um, you know, the basket holds up to, you know, three pounds of, um, like food, like you could do mm. three, three pounds of chicken wings. Um, but the great thing about it too, is like, I can put like two potatoes in there and cook them a little bit and then put in you know, my salmon or maybe some asparagus. So I can actually cook a whole meal. I've gotten really good at it That's awesome. <laughs> but I, I use it I, I literally it. use it every day and I it's funny too because I renovated my kitchen I did a gut renovation of my kitchen during COVID I know crazy but um you know I'm kind of, I'm so glad I did it because I realized why am I dealing with this kitchen that is just not not appropriate for my level of skill <laughs> so, <laughs> um so and I put in a you know a beautiful Italian oven stove and an yes. oven and um I don't turn the oven on very often <laughs> because I'm using my air fryer every day. Because so. you have and, that, yeah. And obviously, you know, my I would say the next two in, in line for this for the siblings would be, you know, my food processor. Um, I actually, during COVID, I took a lot of cooking classes and learned how to make pasta by hand, but now I've Ooh. advanced my method to, I do it in the food processor. It's so quick and easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, like, you know, my coffee maker who, who can live without a coffee. You maker. need it. I know. That's yeah. awesome. This is, uh, you know, this has been uh, great because again, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, product and a brand products and brand that I, that I really love. And I really use, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. That's Mary Rogers, ladies and gentlemen, the head of marketing communications at Cuisinart. This has been an awesome episode. I'm Vincent Petrofessa. That's AJ Gupta. This has been another episode of The Marketing Stir. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to The Marketing Stir podcast by Starista. Please like, rate, and subscribe. If you're interested in being a guest on the podcast, please email us at themarketingstir at starista.com. And thanks for listening.